my friends. Uh, I think everybody who is interested in Central Asia is my friend. <laughs> and uh, I also would like um, to acknowledge the many sponsors of the project that are here. And these are people who provided funds uh, during my crowdfunding campaign. And without your support, this nothing would be uh, would have been possible. Uh, so uh, I will start with the um, definition. Uh, so this is the book. And uh, so promoting Central Asia through children's literature. And first of all, um, I will just say how I define Central Asia um, in my book. It is five countries, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. So um, why do I uh, write about Central Asia? Why do I promote this project? Because of course I was born and raised there. This is me in, uh, in the garden. So as any child in Central Asia, I grew up in multi-ethnical community. I grew up on, um, on the border between China and Kazakhstan, mainly it was Uyghur, still is Uyghur area. So even in my kindergarten group, there were like at least 10 ethnic groups, you know, like Kazakhs, Uyghurs, Russian, Ukrainians, Germans, um, so Koreans. This is the street I grew up on. Uh, that right in the middle is my house. Um, and this is the environment that I grew up with. You know, animals around me, you know, uh, real milk every uh, evening. Uh, the Uyghur women who uh, first made uh, tangers in, in their backyards and then they would bake real non or none in, um, in them. So I grew up eating fresh bread. So uh, when I became mother, and I now have two children, who are three and six year old, um, I wanted to tell them about the land that I came from. But, and I started collecting literature. And I brought some Kazakh tales and myths from Kazakhstan, and I asked my friends, uh, uh, actually from all uh, former Soviet republics, to bring books like Narodny uh, Skazki, yeah, like uh, folk tales. And what I found out that there was very little, little uh, literature, actually. Uh, a lot of what was published during the Soviet Union uh, is not published anymore. Um, there are no new editions. And that is we talk, if we talk about something in Russian language, uh, almost nothing in English language. So, um, for example, in the local library, uh, this was like a demonstration, like a month of Silk Road. And you can see like, actually, what you cannot see is our region. <laughs> How can you imagine Silk Road without Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan or Tajikistan? And yet, our region is not represented. Uh, if you take literature in English, uh, also very uh, few choices. So the first two books, uh, uh, books, Where Does the Water Come From and Tales Told in Tents, you can buy it on Amazon. The other two books uh, are the Soviet edition from 1975 and 1989. All other books, two more books are just on Kindle. So it's only electronic version. A lot of books about Navruz, but of course they are mainly a Persian version, Persian Navruz, mm -hmm. uh, which means uh, Iranian uh, authors. I also found out that the countries themselves, uh, the countries from the region, they do not uh, use the instrument of children's literature uh, in promoting the region. Uh, through their cultural events, uh, they aim only at policy makers, they art lovers, but they leave outside of the activities children, and especially the younger uh, generation. So, and of course, little coverage, if any, in, in the media, libraries, festivals. Um, 
even if we take our Washington DC area, nearly every ethnic group has its own festival, right? Except Central Asian diaspora. <laughs> Uh, probably because our diaspora is still very young in the United States and we still need time to get together, to unite and um, see what we have to give to this country and how can we promote our interests in this country but also how to preserve our uh, cultural heritage while we live in the United States. Um, so I think diaspora needs a little bit more than just restaurants. Um, and um, I know that uh, Kazakh artists, they started writing comics based on Kazakh mythology, and you can even find them on Amazon. Um, but that's basically it. And even I hear from parents that even inside the region, there is very little literature for young children, especially toddlers. And my children were very young, so <laughs> I know that all those myths and folks, folk tales, they are very good, but they're slightly for older generation. So that's why I wrote this book about uh, a boy uh, named Barzu and who lives in Tajik uh, Mountains. Um, and uh, the topics of the books are mainly bread, clay ovens, tandoors or tanurs, and uh, dry apricots or fresh fruits. Many people would ask me, um, why these topics? So strange, like, what, you have nothing else to write about? Uh, really, people would ask me that. And to, but to me, this is daily life, and this is really what you start missing when you are outside of the, that region. And yes, these subjects, or objects, they're simple, but they are vital to Central Asian life. So um, the bread culture, for example, is so rich and so ancient that um, every single aspect uh, or stage of everybody's life uh, is reflected in that bread culture. You have special bread for weddings, you have special bread for funerals. When a child is born, it's another kind of bread that is baked. Um, you eat different bread in the mornings or in the evenings. Every non is uh, a signature of that particular city or that particular region. Mm -hmm. You have different kinds of uh, bread. <coughs> which are about 200 kinds. Um, and uh, it can be small as uh, little cookies or it can be as big as one meter in diameter. Uh, also, uh, bread and tandoors are strongly associated with mothers and grandmothers and family connections. So I think parents, they actually love the book more than children because it brings them back to sweet times with their grannies. And apricots. Uh, I grew up in the city uh, famous for its sweet uh, apricots. And so for me, it is a symbol of childhood. And here in the book, apricot is more like uh, an example of this food culture in Central Asia, where every fruit, peaches, uh, plums, uh, grapes, it's all so sweet and full of Central Asian sun. So the book is published in two languages, two language versions, Russian and uh, English. And uh, so the story and the uh, tale itself is basically about uh, the boy who lives in the mountains, about his brother, and together with brother they visit their grandmother. Uh, who happens to be a great uh, bread maker. Uh, so he meets his friends on the way. Uh, he also has a father who is, of course, a thunder master, the best in the area. Uh, his grandmother, she's not only a great bread maker, but she's a wonderful storyteller, and she's a very wise uh, person. A lot of information, so that is the first part of the book, and a lot of information is conveyed through the illustrations and the um, beautiful uh, illustrations. 
Uh, then after, uh, and so of course grandmother tells the story about the bread of wonder, which is basically a story about famous Samarkand bread, mm -hmm. which doesn't spoil even after three years. After that first part of the book, there is this uh, travel to the world of Barzu, where I give parents ideas on how to have like hands-on activities, so they sort of recycle all that information that they just received through the tale and story and then there are recipes that they can try at home and children love this i received so many letters and messages from parents that all of a sudden their children are interested in baking and making uh, bread and another part of the book is ethnographic notes where i go into uh, a lot of details basically every paragraph that is sort of simplified text in the tale, I unfold it into several chapters and go into more details about Tamerlane's mosaics, for example, about clay ovens, about um, a bread, and about 200 kinds of bread, and I provide uh, like 12 the most interesting uh, examples of non in the region. And, uh, and for example, uh, here I explained how uh, Timurid style architecture um, evolved over 200 years um, and um, through the Mughal Empire architecture, it, we have the um, Taj Mahal, for example. Mm -hmm. So without uh, uh, Guru Mir and Bibi Khanem Mausoleum, there wouldn't be uh, Taj Mahal. Uh, the illustrations uh, are uh, made by a prominent Tajik illustrator, uh, Farooq Nigmazadeh, who lives in Dushanbe in Tajikistan. And uh, uh, here I wanted to just give uh, a few examples of our creative process together, how we work together. So in the story, uh, the merchant Faiz goes uh, from the city of Ludoms, he goes to Hindustan. And so you can see the sort of sketches that the artist prepared of the caravan um, with, the, with the fortress in the back of the illustration. So then I, uh, then I would reply to him that I want to see this thing <laughs> because I want to show the real fortress in Rajasthan, Jodhpur. Um, and it's really a stunning fortress. Um, and then I would also consult with a historian and ask him, uh, for example, here you can see donkeys and women in the caravan, and I would ask historian, would it be possible for actually donkeys and dogs being in, in caravan like that? And, the, uh, and he would say no. For, for these long distances, it really would be just camels and horses. Um, so after all this discussion, uh, uh, and uh, also looking at pictures of the interior of the fortress, uh, because I was there uh, uh, about 10 years ago, and so we came up with these two illustrations, so now we have that one, and this one. So children see that in the illustration and then in the ethnographic notes I go into further details about Jodhpur and uh, Rajasthan and Hindustan and how Central Asia is connected to the uh, Mughal Empire and architect architecture in India. Here is how we discuss the, the, the cover of the book. Um, uh, how did I collect information for the, uh, for the book? First of all, of course, my personal experience, my childhood and living in the region and traveling around. Um, my husband and I, we also attended real uh, tunnel workshops um, in Tajikistan and Kazakhstan. Of course, also existing literature, books, and uh, social media. Uh, during this research, I actually realized how little people inside the region know about this simple things like tanur and dry apricots. They probably know very little, especially people in the city. They don't even 
know anymore how they make tunnels. And I would like to touch on my discussions in Facebook groups. So I joined about 10 regional Facebook groups uh, representing members from all five republics. And in each group, I placed uh, the questions. So what other words do you know for this clay oven, for example? Or what is the name of this instrument? How do you call dry apricots? And would you share the names of none with me? Yeah. <laughs> and boy, people got really excited. I would get like, I don't know, at least 200 comments under each post. And um, together, and members of the groups together with me, uh, were rediscovering their own culture, their own language and history. People were very excited about the subject and generously they shared the names, uh, recipes, life stories around them. They checked for translations in the dictionaries. They would go to the bazaar in Samarkand at 1 a.m., interview uh, women who sell the bread there and send me the videos. Um, they would even order and send me real non-parts because they would get interested and they would go to like uh, Kishlak outside of the city and see how they can, how you can make this instrument out of uh, feather. And it was really, really exciting. And uh, in Taji group, for example, uh, we discovered at least 20 names of this instrument just inside Tajikistan. And they were amazed because they didn't know. They would first they would start arguing because in, in the story it's just non part and then other people would start arguing, no, non part is not the, the right word for it, it's mukh par. And they would argue for a while which word is right. And of course my position is there is no right word. There is a word that there are words that people use and it's wonderful. And then people from Pamir would join and they would give another like 15 different names because the communities there are isolated by the mountains and each community has their own language and dialect. And it was just fantastic, all that discussion. Uh, I also follow the rule of three. So at least three people would have to confirm the name. And there was this name that would come from Macha region in Tajikistan, the word Pish, they would call it Pish. Nobody could know the translation, nobody, and only two people confirmed, so I was almost ready not to include it into the list. And then the guy sends me a personal message, and he says, yes, my mother and my grandmother used that name for that object. And I'm like, oh, great, wonderful, thank you. Could you please comment under the post so everybody else would see? And he would say, I cannot because I work for the security agency. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it was so touching for me that he had this serious job, yet he followed the discussion. He made sure to send me the message to make sure that I include that name into the list. And it was similar experience when I ran the crowdfunding campaign. When we collected funds, people would send me letters and explain why they invest into the project and why it means so much to them. And one story really impressed me, like um, the guy who now lives in New York, he told me that during the civil war in Tajikistan, he would be, uh, like, while there is all this shooting going on on the streets, he would be sitting inside the house and read the folk tales to his little brother. And so he thinks that, like, these books for children, it, it is something important, and it really can change somebody's life. I also crowdsource for the dog's name, uh, <laughs> and... Uh, People would send me like hundred names, uh, remembering stories of their little pets, and their kishlaks, and uh, of course I've chose the, the most seldom one, uh, which is Ashdar, which comes from Persian word Ashdahor, raven. Uh, so yeah, that's how all this uh, sort of uh, creative process worked, and I love the engagement of the community and how people got uh, really excited. So who benefits from this book? Of course, children benefit from the book, children around the world. This is the picture, I just came back from Ukraine where I printed the second edition. 
and uh, we had a wonderful meeting with the uh, Kiev uh, school children and you can see they made little nods with from play-dohs and non pars uh, we of course had Uzbek picnic recently and children were making uh, bread and this is just last Sunday Pushkin festival uh, I read the story and we made uh, more non and and the tan tanur. So um, I really love how children uh, children are so curious and they're so thirsty for this kind of information. Um, so and of course, well, uh, the tourists benefit from the book. Many read the book before they go to the region and they want to learn more about. Uh, the region, the museums, because they provide more information now. Two museums carry the book, the uh, Textile Museum uh, in DC and the Asia Society Museum in New York City. Um, and uh, I think diplomats also, the one who go uh, to the region to work in the embassies, they would benefit a lot from all this information and they know what kind of loan to buy there when they go to the bazaar, uh, local bazaar. I would probably round up now. I also have a short video of how they make tanurs in Dushanbe, um, but maybe we can watch it a little bit later. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much for the presentation. I would like, in fact, now to give the floor to our guest here before we kind of watch the, the small film. So we have three guests for present. Um, I have. Um, a very warm feeling to Uyghur community where Marina grew up because uh, uh, my mom is Uyghur and so a lot of the emotions and memories that Marina has I have maybe not to such a uh, big extent because we, we visited Marina grew up in what was formerly called Panfila and now it's Jarkan um, so I, I had the privilege of visiting but never lived there um, I just find so inspiring uh, that Marina embarked on this journey and I'll just use a couple of minutes to, to maybe share why I think this project is so important and why I was <laughs> very pleased to support Marina in, in this, in a, in a very little way. As Marina correctly said, there is just literally almost nothing outside of academia in Central Asia even on such a big country as, as Kazakhstan and, and of course the other Central Asian states. For Kazakhstan, the only non-academic book that I keep recommending is Apples Are From Kazakhstan by a British journalist and he did a great job, Chris Robbins, I think his name is. Um, so even for adults, there is hardly anything on Central Asia written in non-dry, non-academic way and for kids there is uh, literally almost nothing and I think it's just so important to engage kids at this young age. I love that the kids have no stereotypes at all mm -hmm. and they just have no prejudice on the opposite they're just such sponges mm -hmm. of things that are new, interesting, and um, just the way they see the world and how open they are and they think it's such a beautiful stage in, in human development to be exposed and, and Marina and, uh, and the illustrators she worked with, they just, they have done an incredible job of doing it in, in such a beautiful way. Um, Marina is very modest, <laughs> I think it doesn't come through enough how much research went into ethnographic notes for example uh, in the book it may be you know not that many pages but I know how many days months went into <laughs> researching every single little piece of data that she puts and she puts it in a very accessible way but actually there is a lot of you know truly academic research behind it um, you know, in addition to engaging the community and really doing it, a project, of, you know, <laughs> the entire village Mahala project, <laughs> uh, she also did a lot on her own in terms of studying and researching. And, um, and I really appreciate that she took it so seriously 
that for her it was important that what she puts in the book there was nothing that oh, okay it's for kids it will do uh, she really took it very seriously in terms of not saying things that are not true so <laughs> I'm, I'm really proud of Marina and um, I just know how how much she poured into this her soul and her love for the region and I just hope you know that there are already plans for the continuation of the story and uh, hopefully the book will take over the world. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Hi everyone, and thank you so much for organizing and inviting me. Uh, my name is Fudal Hazarov, and I'm from Tajikistan, where she wrote the book, and I'm very happy to talk about it a little bit. So, uh, I'm the outreach manager at Tajik American Culture Association. Uh, our association mission is like her to introduce our culture to different communities in the U.S. and also uh, foster Tajiks living in the U.S. to, you know, explain our culture. So I think learning one another's culture is very important and uh, because it gives a sense of uh, understanding who we are, where we came from and where our roots came from. And also uh, it's also very important for our kids to uh, learn where their parents and grandparents grew up because you know in today's society most of the kids in their free times they spend on their you know video games or cartoons and there are not so many books that you can show them or you know explain about their culture because you know as an example I remember back in my childhood uh, most of my free times I used to either spend cleaning our garden you know <laughs> or spending my time with my grandparents where they used to tell me like you know stories about their life, how you know, <coughs> they were like living life without, let's say, electricity or cars, and and the most fun part was for me to visit my grandparents to ride a donkey. I don't know why. I mean, it was so fun. Just you know, they had a donkey, and I wish I I, I was asking them to buy a horse, but they didn't they didn't buy it. <coughs> it's okay. So yeah, I think it's very important. And as another example, it's in her book. And I'm very proud and like honored that she wrote about our country because we have so many like beautiful histories and okay. and one of the examples is that the tandoor, the one uh, the oven made with clay, and uh, I remember my mom cooking, uh, you know, making fire and opening the bread and the the dough and stitching it to the you know to the wall which is right now when you tell to people they, they don't know like I'm like what are you talking about you know it's, it's impossible so yeah I think the book is very important and I just wanted to thank you so much to you know writing about our book and also hopefully you're gonna write a lot about our culture that I can you know I don't have kids though hopefully when I have when I'm gonna have kids I can you know take this books and explain it to them in many ways thank you so much